The Happy Pair podcast is sponsored by Instant Brand. Use the code Happy Pair to get 20% off for the rest of 2023. Now, we were just chatting. Let's go. Let's just st- jump straight in there. Amazaki. We're talking about fermentation and we're talking about Amazaki. And like, we're, we're, we're into fermentation. We're into lacto-fermentation. We're 20 and then, years in the food game. And then you just dropped a, like a little bomb there of, I mean, you don't know Amazaki. Amazaki. Let, let's, let's start off What is Amazaki? Talk. So was it? Amazake is a uh, sake before it's fermented into wine. So it is a rice um, product that is um, fermented with a thing called koji. So koji fermentation is a kind of a, an advanced fermentation that has existed in Asia for thousands of years that it predates electricity and was originally used as a preservative. Nature's electricity. Exactly. God knows how they figured it out because what it is is you're growing mold. It's like a white mold, a fungus, on a substrate such as rice or barley or uh, something with starches and protein and um, so grains, basically. And you're incubating it at um, 30 degrees approximately. It's quite a warm temperature. Yeah, warm and very humid. So like 70 or 80 degrees. So you can do that in like these kind of rationale ovens, you know, these com- those combi chefy ovens. So um, 30 degree temperature, about 70 to 80% humidity. Just think about like an incubation chamber. That's yeah. all you're doing. So that breeds mold. Exactly. Yeah. So you're just growing mold on a grain. Now that sounds bizarre, but it is this incredible powerhouse of enzymatic um, uh, tra- transformation. So you add this koji to a thing, say uh, an- another grain, um, peas or quinoa, or you can use vegetables, you can use anything, you can use um And this is like trim. adding the mold and blending it together just or adding it? M- imagine just blending a kind of a, a soup. You've got your koji, you've got your ingredients. So a miso is obviously a firm, um, low on moisture product. But then you've got things like soy sauce, which is mm. obviously a liquid version of miso. And then you've got the kind of, in the animal world, you've got uh, garums, which is, uh, a garum is um, like a soy sauce, but from an animal. So uh, buttermilk, garum. It's the same thing as soy sauce, but it's from an animal. Wow. So a, a soy sauce is named a shoyu, and then you've got the animal version, a garum, and then you've got miso, which is the solid version. And then you've got amazake, which is what we were Ooh. chatting about before Still, this. this is like a masterclass here. Yeah, well, fermentation, I'll say this, is the golden gateway to zero waste. Now, what I mean by that is when you buy a miso, it's using virgin products, Uh, When you use soy sauce, that is virgin soy, okay? So it's grown and turned into those products. But where we, Silo, this is, um, have done something different is we've thought to ourselves, so this koji thing, this mold, it has this power of introducing incredible deep umami flavors. But what if we do that with surplus ingredients that would have otherwise been wasted, you know, carrot tops and um, beetroot peelings and basically onion skins, onion skins and total waste. What if we were to apply the same principle, adding koji and uh, salt and then fermenting it? What would happen? And that's what we've been doing for about four or five years uh, to the point where we're now about to open. Actually, this is, um, I shouldn't be saying this, but a fermentation factory. Cool. Well, you, well, you've got you've got a fermentarium. Like I remember when we visited last, you had and it was it. Cool. a fermentarium yeah, yeah, yeah. where you had one cubic ton of koji infused fermented food waste, which would have been waste, which you were fermenting and just And you walked in, compounding so you walked flavor. down this magical kitchen. So it's like a treasure trove of fantastical like exotic, not exotic, but just diverse ingredients from all over the world that yeah. are typically purchased. Most of the UK. Yeah, most of the UK. And then you open up this closet and it's known as a fermentorium and you feel like, oh, yeah. yeah, the amount of stuff in there. Yeah, the, the fermentarium is, um, I'm not sure where the name came from, but we've got these big glass doors that kind of uh, cupboard it in. Um, and it's like an aquarium and it's fermentarium. So we've called it the fermentarium, which is a really lovely name that's stuck. And um, as that project moves forward, we're just going to refer to it as the silo fermentarium. But it is this, uh, as, as I said, the golden gateway to zero waste because everything that four years ago was... Um, too unconvenient to turn into a product. I like inconvenient. That's a very deliberate word choice. 
So a typical restaurant would waste 50% of what it buys or purchases or what comes through its front door. That's the average, 50%. 50%, 50%. gets wasted. Um, we're talking about the stems and the kind of the peels and the skins. And or what customers don't eat by as well. weight goes in the bin or ideally in a compost bin. However, um, when you're a zero waste restaurant, you want that to be as small a percentage as possible. And about four years ago, before fermentation, we were composting about 10 to 15% of what was coming through the front door. And you had the, what do you call it? Biodigester. Biodigester. Yeah, the, 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 the biodigester, the which is a compost machine, basically, which we had to, I say had to, we actually gave it away because when fermentation entered the equation, that food waste went from 15% to less than 1%. So this is the power of fermentation, especially koji-based fermentation, because it has this transformational power. It has this metamorphic effect to something that you just can't figure out what to do with. And it has this um, introduction of umami, which is what we all kind of associate with that sort of advanced fermentation. Which, which is that, for anyone listening, that's that bacon flavor. It's that really depth of flavor, only identified as a flavor in the early 90s. Yep. You know, literally umame, the direct mm -hmm. translation of the Japanese word is deliciousness. So it's that fifth yeah. flavor profile. When you go to Asian restaurants and everything tastes like mad delicious, they've just chucked a load of MSG in there. And MSG is this um, monosodium glutamate, which um, is incredibly high in MSG. And it just has that kind of mad deliciousness. Like if you're ever making a broth and you just put a pinch of MSG in, it will immediately taste significantly better, you know, 20, 30% better just from that pinch of. And has MSG M got anything to do with fermentation or koji or anything? No, or umami? no it's just the umami association. No. It's just, you know, so fermentation is not the only thing that brings umami. Like there's natural amounts of umami in uh, tomatoes, uh, even things like you wouldn't think like chicory is very high in umami. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot to umami, but fermentation, um, yeah, it, it's just very naturally you associate that with it. Our newsletter is the best way to stay up to date with Happy Pair recipes, podcasts, and general Happy Pair information. Full details in the show notes where you can sign up for our weekly newsletter that I personally write myself. So we've partnered with Instant Brand and they really are helping people and helping us rethink the way we cook. One of my favorites is their Vortex Versazone air fryer with a clear cook window. It's got this big drawer where like, I know there's a craze about air fryers, but this is the air fryer of air fryers. I love it. Yeah, it really is. Um, they've also got a, a Vortex Plus air fryer oven. There's an Instant Pot Superior slow cooker, which is really cool because you can actually saute first before you slow cook all in the same pot. And it's and a great it's, way of making healthy food just easy it to It really cook. is. Well, well that, like I, I honestly use the air fryer and the Instant Pot all the time. Like I genuinely do at home. Use the code HAPPYPAIR to get 20% off for the rest of 2023. Okay, Doug, before we get lost in fermentation and the yes. gateway to yeah. zero I waste. I want to come back to this for <laughs> sure. We should come back okay, to Okay, so it. you're an incredible chef. You're someone that growing up struggled with school. I wonder if we talk about that. Yeah, let, let's, let's get... Let's, even let's listening get to here, you're incredibly articulate. You're, when you talk, I find myself going, whoa. So can we talk about Don't your education it. process? Don't jinx it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I've just had three incredible, enlightening years of therapy. And one of the most profound revelations in that journey um, was understanding why Silo exists. What was my motivation to open a zero waste restaurant, the world's first zero waste restaurant? And it is not what you think. Um, my parents were not environmentalists. I was not in a community of foodies, um, you know, growing vegetables. That was not what was occurring. Uh, I'm from a food desert. I'm from a, a working class, um, post-industrial kind of miners town. Um, and food was just fuel as in not, not a kind of a pleasant fuel. It just, you ate food and you know, it, it, there was no love to it. There was no love. It was frozen food. It was from, um, you know, a packet. It was in a microwave. And Much that's more factory than farm. Yeah. Fa factory food. Um, and so, yeah, that wasn't a thing. Now, you know, I became a chef, not because, yeah, I was in love with food. I became a chef because I was a school dropout. Um, and... <sighs> 
um, basically a neurodivergent. So neurodivergent basically means my brain's wired differently. I definitely have dyslexia. I definitely have dyscalculia, none of which is tested. Sorry. What's dyscalculia? It's like dyslexia for like numbers. Okay, gotcha. Um, so when I was when I was in maths class, I was just like terrified because everyone was like far superior to me at everything that was being talked about. I just I was I was I was like a statue. I was frozen with fear because I I, I felt so dumb. Um, so dyscalculia, dyslexia, um, I think dyspraxia as well, um, and then. Uh, I think uh, none of this is diagnosed. <laughs> I think that I, um, I have Asperger's or slash ADHD. <laughs> Basically, it's a neurodivergence and it, it seems like a um, um, disability or a series of disabilities. And uh, I'm not sure that's exactly true. And I've only discovered that in later life when I've kind of found my place in the world. But before that, I was in institutionalized education and that was not my place in the world. That was a very stressful place for, 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 for me. I was a mute as a child. I wouldn't speak. Um, and that was pre, that was before school. And then I went into this environment that I found terrifying because I didn't understand anything. Um, and needless to say, I developed somewhat of a, 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 a failure complex um, there's a lot of talk of failure in the silo book. You'll, you'll notice now you read it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, there's uh, the zero waste blueprint is the, 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 the silo, the silo book, but in school, um, I was terrified and, uh, this is a true story. A teacher once actually called me dumb in front of the whole class. And that's quite traumatizing. I was already, um, I would wear the plainest clothing so I wouldn't stand out and no one would notice me. I would have this like hair that would like cover my eyes. I would look down at the pavement as I was walking. I would walk at the side of the street, not in the middle. I would be quiet. I'd stand on the edge of the edge of the group. I mean, you're um, quite isolated even at, like in terms of friends and hanging out yeah, and playing. You were just I invisible. Was, I was crippled by self-doubt, crippled. Um, and so as soon as I was finishing my GCSEs, I, I was, uh, I, I, you know, I got out, I, I was straight out like a bat out of hell and, um, I didn't know what to do. And so one day, 15, now, 15 or 16. yeah, 15, 16. And I saw this, uh, cool kid that I really liked and was really nice to me. Um, and he was a chef. And he was working at this local restaurant, um, the West Retford Hotel. And um, I just thought he was cool and he was nice to me. And so that was it. I was like, I, I'm going to be a chef. Um, no interest in food. But <laughs> so I applied to be a, a pot wash because that's, you know, I could you just do that. Bottom, and, yeah. and the good thing about being a chef is you don't need any qualifications. Um, in fact, it's almost frowned upon within hospitality, like cooking educations, you know, laughed at because the education that exists for cooking is, 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 is not great. So the, the best way to learn was in kitchens and that's what I did and, um, became a chef and sort of had this, this failure complex, this feeling, this sort of suppressed anger, um, from all those years of feeling Bubbling under the surface. Yeah. From feeling dumb and, um, I had a real drive to, to prove someone wrong. And there wasn't a specific someone. I was trying to prove society wrong. I was trying to prove there was no sing singular thing that I thought I'm angry at you or you or you. I was just angry and I needed to prove, and this is all unconscious. So I didn't know any of this. I needed to prove that I wasn't a failure. Um, and so I wrote my CV and sent it to the best restaurants in the country because, you know, there's this kind of gradation of quality, you know, via the Michelin stars and the rosettes and all this kind of, uh, superficial nonsense. Um, so I would, you know, send my CV and I went to the third best restaurant in the UK and, um, worked 90 hour weeks and got bullied and, 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 and never saw the light of day. And, and got cause in these restaurants, there is quite this kind pecking of order. macho pecking order. Yes, chef, no chef. And like, it's, it's quite yeah, authoritarian. It's, it's quite frightening. It's, 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 it's a, it was a terrifying industry 15, 20 years ago. It really was. Um, 
But um, but yeah, I sort of endured it because I had nowhere else to go. You know, I knew that this was my sort of only shot at redemption. But also you must have felt that you had a bit of a flair to it, that you felt like. Mm, I wasn't very good at that either. I, I, I wasn't good at cooking. Um, I still don't think I'm that good at cooking. I'm, I'm okay. Um, I've le- le- later found what I'm good at in life. Um, but it took a while. <laughs> and when I was, I was always the laughing stock of the kitchen, you know, it wasn't going well for me. <laughs> um, and then, um, but yeah, you did win a competition, which gave I did. You, yeah. yeah, you won yeah. The chef, British chef. Yeah. BBC young chef of the year. And it was a bit of a zero to hero, excuse the pun, um, uh, sort of moment. And there was a bit of luck in it. There was one and a half thousand people entered the competition and I don't know, the kind of, it just swung in my favor. And I just, every time I was cooking in these spaces, I somehow, I don't know where it, some miracle occurred and I just did something that I didn't know I was even capable of. It was bizarre. And there was an enormous amount of creativity in the, um, in it, 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 they were looking for creativity, which works in my favor because I am creative. I am very you don't creative. Think in straight lines. Exactly. I think that's in where circles. your neurodivergence becomes an superpower. Exactly. Superpower. Exactly. So I don't know if you know much about dyslexia, but dyslexia is just a different um, uh, movement of neurons in the in the human brain. Whereas a lot of brains can uh, um, certain subjects so like tighter clusters of information moving around. When you're dyslexic, it's less of a tight cluster and more of a spread cluster, and so information travels more freely across various or varying subjects so i can be talking that can seem totally unrelated <laughs> i can, we can be talking about i don't know food and i'm in my mind i'm thinking i'm seeing patterns within philosophy when we're talking about food and that is you know uh steve jobs uh, a classic you know uh, dyslexic brain he's described creativity as um connecting dots and that's interesting because you know some vast arraying subjects you connect dots and he was dyslexic and Richard Branson. And there's loads of like innovative thinkers um, who have changed the world that are dyslexic. And the word begins with dis, i.e. disability, mm. but it's not. It's just a different way that yeah. the brain processes information. I love that. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, <clears throat> I got kind of really, really, really good, all of a sudden, it was kind of like this weird miracle. I don't know where it came from. And Largely, after that, did you feel more confident? Did you feel more like, actually, maybe I am the real deal. I'm less... It, 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 there was like this kind of nirvana, this, this euphoric three-day period where I went so high and then I crashed. You know, like with any sort of experience, you go into a flow state, you come out of it and you crash. Um... I crashed and went into this quite negative space and it was, um, it was a feeling I, I didn't know it then, but, uh, a sort of, a this thing that I'd done was superficial. I, you know, I was voted the best, but what does the best mean? The best at cooking? Like, what does that mean? I, you know, am I, I don't think I am. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm not. Cause the chefs in my kitchen was teasing me the other day for being useless. <laughs> so I don't think I'm that good. I think I got lucky. Um, I went into this sort of hole of doubt again. Um, and I, I had to, I had to, I, I had to explore this, 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 this void, this empty space. Um, and, and, I don't know if I had any semblance of clarity or, or, or discernment from what where that feeling was coming from, but I had this feeling that I had to um, travel the world and find some sense of purpose that was not superficial, you know, not just like grading how good one is, you know, versus another. It like, wasn't best uh, and better and that kind of category. Yeah. Of my food is better than your subjective. Yeah, exactly. So I, I, I then sort of upped the, the ante and went to the world's best restaurants. And I went to all the world's best restaurants and this kind of pattern. You this was to work in them. This was to. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was to w- work in and um, some of them was stagiaire, you know, uh, internships working in the best restaurants. Some was working and there was all these patterns that I was recognizing. And this is quite an interesting word, well, pattern recognition. And I was recognizing patterns that 
many different things, but the industry, the the higher the caliber, um, the greater the amount of waste. Um, uh, yeah, there was a lot of things. There was this kind of industrialization of the world's best restaurants. And what I mean by that is when you work as a chef in the world's best restaurants, it's like a, um, a conveyor belt of, you know, you've got one chef doing one or two jobs all day. Um, whereas in the lower class kitchens, you'd have one chef doing 50 jobs a day. So there's all this diversity of experience and skills and multitasking. And in these world class restaurants, I find myself just doing two jobs. Chopping carrots into yeah, julienne or whatever. Yeah. And anyway, so there's just all these different patterns I was recognizing. And um, I, I was sort of falling out of love very quickly with gastronomy. I didn't mention, but I fell in love with food in this journey, in, in this sort of decade of cooking, this first decade, I really fell in love with food. And, um, and from um, a working class background, food, wasting food, the one kind of good value I learned from food was not to waste it. You know, just don't, food is precious. Um, we don't have money, don't waste food, etc. cetera. Um, but in these sort of... Uh, restaurants and um, sitting on the top of a uh you know on top of the planet um the there was a bunch of things i realized and i was sort of out of love with it and and sort of losing faith in it but i didn't know where to go and um i i this is sort of where silo started basically and i realized that um i wanted i didn't realize I was looking for a way out and I was looking for a way to rebel against this sort of uh, machine, this, uh, you know, rage against the machine sort of moment. This wasteful food system, which was... It was everything. It Honestly, it wasn't like I was trying to rage against food waste. I was raging against the machine. I was raging against the institutionalization and I was angry at uh, homogenous, you know, homogenous kind of cultural thinking, the way that it, it was... It was Un, yeah, I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but it was the whole kind of mix that I was um, not into. And um, this was a recurring pattern in myself that I, I kept wanting to rebel against these in institutions. Um, and um, and I think that Silo was born out of this um, feeling that when when... <clears throat> When you're raised in an environment, in an institutionalized environment that uh, breeds a certain way of thinking and that is not the way you think, um, you feel rejected from that system. And I unconsciously have um, um, a sort of hatred for that institutionalization. A, a, um, a resentment is a better word, not hatred. I have a deep resentment for um, systems that were, were rejecting me. Probably stemming back from your schooling, you know, your schooling institution, your, you felt so out of place that it was like just that carried forward that distrust of institutions in general. I want to create a system with which, with which in I prosper and I fit in and that fits in more with people like me. And then Silo was born. And Silo, so, so you're in Australia, you bumped into, I remember a Dutch man uh, who introduced, Joost Backer. Joost Backer introduced the concept of zero waste and kaboom, a spark was lit. So he was this sort of um, saviour, this light at the end of the tunnel, this, uh, I was working in Sydney Harbour and uh, he had built this incredible construct out of waste materials, post-industrial waste materials. It was a building. I think he's on a down to earth show with Zach with Zach, Zach Efron. Efron. Yeah, he's yeah. featured in it. Yeah. And so and he's building. this incredible Dutch artist that was uh, raised when he was uh, in the Netherlands and next to landfill. And so there's kind of an interesting theme there for him. And so when he moved to Melbourne um, and became an artist, he would naturally gravitate towards post-industrial waste and he would use it to harness nature, um, a big biodynamic uh, family, generations of biodynamic farmers, and they grew tulips um, and they would have grow their own food and had this very sort of agricultural mindset. And so he would um, use post-industrial waste to harness nature in really beautiful, abstract, creative ways. And he was commissioned by the Sydney uh, Sydney Food Festival to build a building to put a cafe or a food system within it. And that's where I happened to be in the right place at the right time. 
Um, it was called the Greenhouse by Yoast. Um, Yoast Backer is 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 he. Um, and I, I I was sort of down and out in Sydney and uh, looking for a you know. Uh, an alternative life <laughs> and um walked into this incredible project and um within a very short conversation Yos had explained to me that he'd you know erected this building to do something about the waste that exists um so this was in 2011 so a long time before the subject of waste and sustainability were mainstream um and he said to me you know, we've got this building made of waste, but we've got a food system inside it. And, you know, we are creating waste, not a lot, but some. Do you think as a chef, you could not have a bin? And um, yeah, and that was it. That was sort of your beginning. mind went, woohoo, here we go. I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know what I'd never really thought about waste. Now I've thought a lot about it. Um, but then I was just looking for a way out of this world that I deplored. Um, and so I just said to him, yeah, <laughs> I could do it. I didn't know what doing it was, but I just committed to this brilliant human being. And he had this very extraordinary creative energy. It was almost like he was from the future. Um, you've got to meet him. You've got wow. to meet him. You've got to get him on the podcast. He's going to be coming to the UK and, um, I'll invite him to Great. Greystones. Jeez. Great deal. Cool. Great. There's a date. Can't wait. I so, said, okay. So that was kind of the inception That's of the concept of silo. And that was where you started the world's first zero waste restaurant. And In your Brighton. dream was to have no bin. And we went there and we adored it. You've we been had to both. Yeah, we, yeah, to yeah both. we went to silo, yeah. the one in Brighton a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you you came to the t to two London uh, iterations, but it started in Melbourne with Yoast. We started a silo cafe concept that went on for a year, um, and Yoast. So this had was the pursuit of no a kitchen with no bin. Exactly, and Yoast had this very um, liminal sort of liminal. vision what or does that mean? strategy. Liminal is like the early stages of something. Nice word. Great word. I love liminal. Liminal. And um, so he said, all right, off you go. Put me in this cafe. Thankfully, he had, um, you know, there's a big network around him. He was a very established sort of artist and creative. And um, it was a decent investment. And it was this little cafe, not much bigger than this room. And um, kitted out really nicely. And he sort of had a kind of a, a pretty decent vision of how it was going to work. You know, we we're going to trade directly with farmers and get everything that we need from nature. And it's going to come in reusable vessels. Liquids are going to come in kegs and, you know, stainless steel pails and vegetables are simply just going to come in reusable crates and get everything from nature, package free, no problem. In the kitchen, just don't waste anything. Then if there is waste, i.e. plate waste, eggshells, maybe bones, you know, we can put that in a compost machine. And at the time we had this pretty fancy bit of cutting edge kit, which was a big uh, digester, an aerobic digester, which is kind of mimicking a human stomach with the addition of some uh, metal arms that aerate the mixture. So it's a heated cavity that has microbes um, that when warm and uh, aerated by this sort of movement, this kind of um, cyclical movement of these metal so it's arms. It's like a drum. Uh, yeah, It's a drum, yeah. And um, it just speeds up uh, the decomposition of food waste and turns it into this amazing um, compost. In what type of time? What type of time frame? Uh, 60 kilos in, depending on the surface area. So you can put like, I don't know, a whole watermelon in there. That probably takes two weeks. Uh, but if you put the just the thin rinds of a watermelon, it will take 24 hours. Um, wow. so it, on average about 48 hours, you put food waste in and it's pretty much compost. Wow. Um, yeah. I remember, you, I remember you talked about one time, sorry, I'm going off on a total aside, but you put in a whole lot of, le you'd made lemonade, <laughs> you put in a whole lot of lemon skins to make lemon compost with which to smoke carrots in lemon compost. So the carrots would taste of lemon. Yeah. That's a deep. It's a side uh, tan there. tangent of like the mad kind of cosmic creativity that a system like Silo nurtures and creates just by default. And there's a lot in that. But that was an aside. Anyway, back right, to where we were. Sorry, you. that was... So, no, so no, it's a fascinating. Oh, uh, that was mad. Yeah, yeah. that is mad. Um, so we're in the cafe in Sydney... You know. Yeah, and so Yosa just plopped me in this little cafe, kind of off you go, uh, get things from, from nature and re get them in a reusable vessel, try and cook everything... Uh, he wasn't a chef, so he was just like, you know, just don't waste things. <laughs> and then you've got this compost machine that will capture whatever's remaining. 
And that was the genius vision. That was a three-step genius vision that he had. Um, and so I was like, oh, okay. Um, but that this period in that cafe, mostly on my own, developing stuff in my own time, was the most significant point of my life where I went from who I once was to who I am now. There was this engine started that was previously off since I was born. And this engine just came on and I feel like a different human being. If you met me then and saw me now, you would understand what I mean. That was the 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 the, the terrified mute and who I am now. I'm, you know, very different person. Um because what happened is I found the thing that was gonna fill that void in. The the cement, uh, I don't like cement, it's a bad material, but uh, what would you fill a void in figuratively? I'm not Compost. sure. Compost. Love, love, <laughs> love, you can't, <laughs> yeah, you can't see it really. Well, so, listen, like Phil is subjective. Figuratively, I, I was, I found something which made that void disappear. And I guess where, what it was retrospectively is I found like this pathway that, 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 that made me come alive, that made me so intensely open um, to everything in the universe, to ideas, to creativity, to knowledge, to connection and romance. And I just felt alive. And I started having, I started falling in love with everything, everywhere, music and people and ideas. And it was honestly, it was like an engine started. It was remarkable. And it was this series of revelations that stimulated my brain in a way that was um extraordinary uh, i remember i remember thinking i was there on a monday night trying to make shortbread and um you know yos had left me on my own i was like right how do you you know i was bluffing and telling him that i could do this thing and i had no idea i was a relatively okay chef by this point but i didn't know how to mill flour because you know i'm skipping ahead there but when you deal with nature, you don't buy flour, you buy wheat. When you buy, when you want to buy butter, you don't buy butter, you buy cream. So there I was trying to make shortbread and I had cream and I had whole wheat. Um, <laughs> Yost uh, had uh, a certain degree of prescience and he gave me a, a flour mill and a, a, and a mixer to, to, to churn butter. So I churned butter and I remember it was a Monday night. This is one of the most significant evenings of my life. And I churned the butter and I, I milled the flour and I was just like flour everywhere and buttermilk slapping against the walls. And three hours in and I'd finally got the raw ingredients to make shortbread. <laughs> <laughs> and I was drinking some wine on tap. We had these taps, this hilarious tap system that was, it was such a tight little cafe that the, the, the kegs were underneath the, the benches where people sat because there was no space for kegs. So the seats were on kegs and there's this amazing biodynamic wine from, um, uh, yeah, beautiful Australian winemaking country. And, um, that's when I was drinking a bit of wine and making shortbread and, um, <clears throat> anyway, so four hours in, I was like, right, finally made the shortbread dough and, I was like, this is hard work. Um, and then I popped it in the oven and took it out and took twice as long to bake and it looked completely different. And I'd made shortbread thousands of times. I worked at St. John and we always made shortbread so I could do it blindfolded. And this was this kind of abstraction from what I knew was making shortbread. And it was all very profound and- um, Had a taste. Well, this is it. This Here is, we go. This is, this, is the, this is the moment. I ate it. And everything changed. Everything changed. I tasted it and I could taste grass and I could taste wheat and I could taste nuts and I could taste nature. And I was like, wow, it was so profound. And it was like, you know, you have like mental chatter. And when you have ADHD, which I think I have, uh, there's a lot of men my mind is just always chattering. It just went silent. And what I realized in that moment, this was like, it's just such a significant revelation is that I'm trying to not have a bin. I've been cooking in the world's best restaurants for 10 plus years, trying to like find flavor. And here I am trying to not have a bin. And I found one of the most remarkable upgrades of flavor in any transition, transitional process 
in gastronomy. You know, it's just shortbread, right? It's just such a basic fundamental thing. But the transformation of flavor from what I was doing versus every other shortbread that existed in the planet, this was this holy grail. This was this <sighs> transcendental shortbread. And I realized in that moment, oh my God, this is gold. Zero waste is the future of food. Jeez. I also wonder, like, that's part, such an part incredible. Of it's like uh, it, it's it's like that metaphor. Like, you can get a helicopter to the top of a mountain, and you can go, yeah, it's a beautiful view. But if you hike it yourself and you get all the way up there, suddenly you're like, you appreciate it. And I wonder, part of that was that you went through the toil and the hardship of working out how the hell do I mill that flour? How do I churn the butter? So by the time you made the shortbread, it was like, oh my god, I'm going to make love to this shortbread, metaphorically speaking. Maybe it was the wine. <laughs> <laughs> but it does sound when it was like, shit, I wasn't that short, man. But it doesn't stop there. That was the beginning. That was like the engine being turned on. And that just kind of gave way to this avalanche of various um, thoughts. And then I was thinking, this is this is really the, the framework of Silo. This very night, um, this architecture appeared in my mind. Um and it was this thing I'm trying, I was trying to like figure out, right. I'm, I've not got a bin. And so what am I avoiding? And I was like, right, where does waste exist? And I was thinking about, you know, packaging and tracing it back to like wholesalers. And I was like, right. Okay. These kind of couriers, the people that aren't from a farm and I'm dealing now with farmers and farmers don't have all this plastic and polystyrene and unnecessary, you know, packaging I was like, what's the difference in my mind trying to like silo these, these, these kind of archetypes of the food industry? And I realized that we had, um, you know, what is it, what's unique about a bunch of farmers coming in to this you know, little establishment? And I was like thinking about this world of like industrial, 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 you know, plastic and polystyrene and pollution and, you know, road miles and, um, confusing logistics and it's like you know this umbrella term industrialism so what is what I'm doing different to that and I was like pre-industrial what did a food system look like in the 18th century it looked like what I'm doing now and I, I then coined the term this is a pre-industrial food system and then I was like well is then I was like where does waste come from and then I was like well and then I had this vision, and I don't know if it came in this order. This was a long time ago, and I was drinking some wine. Um, but <laughs> I had this vision of a bin in the jungle and realized there is no bin in the jungle. I was thinking about nature. I was like, there is no bin in nature. It's a human thing. Waste is a human thing. We've designed it into the world, and it's damaging the world in, in, in ways which are irrevocable. So therefore, it is our responsibility to design it out again. The, the whales and the, 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 the animals did not bring waste into the world, but they're dying as a result of that waste. And I just thought, wow. Me. You're allowed first, go for it, yeah. <laughs> um, like, oh my God, like, and then this just like pathway in my mind opened and that is silo and that's just the beginning. And that was just the beginning and a whole bunch of other things, part of the avalanche of ideas kind of opened. And, but yeah, that was 2000 and the beginning of 2012, I believe, uh, in Melbourne. And, um, yeah, that's how it started. Doug found the train. But, the but even with... in your book, like, it's like I, I, I've read your book and it's brilliant and I've only highlighted a few pages and one of them at the very end is zero waste is nature. It says to achieve zero waste is to integrate with nature. A natural food system cannot create waste because everything is nature. Zero waste is nature, which I think is, you've just like. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it's, uh, yeah. It, <laughs> take humans out of the equation. There is no waste. Waste is a human thing. We've designed it. It is an abstraction from nature. There's an interesting guy called Paul Stamets, mushroom yeah, 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 genius. Yeah. My colleague, um, yeah. And he has this theory, which makes perfect sense, is that <laughs> humans as hunter-gatherers, um, actually now I'm like, 
Is this a good idea? But yeah, he he has a theory that he, is the, we were the Stone Ape kind of one of Stone Ape theory or whatever that one. Yeah, psilocybin, um, this um, psychedelic vision uh, created this imagination. So this word imagination is really fascinating paradox because we love imagination um my 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 silo's tagline is waste is a failure of the imagination you know so we're putting imagination on a pedestal it's this shining light but then in this theory imagination's the kind of double-edged sword because no other species has abstract thoughts this is another fascinating thing to consider. So humans have abstractions, you know, we create uh, all these unique um, subcultures and unique forms of music and expression and all these abstractions. And, you know, you don't see dogs listening to the Smiths and, you know, crying and you don't see, you know, giraffes kind of wearing black eyeliner or, you know, wearing punk clothing. It's a very human thing. Um, and the abstract thoughts that we is unique to human species is amazing. You know, we've created some of the most incredible things that will make us cry and we've flown to the moon and we've created advanced healthcare that saves, you know, creates miracles on a daily basis. But <laughs> like boy. with all good paradoxes, there is a, a dark side a cast, a of the moon. Cast. Um yeah, you know, there is no, there's just this balance of positive and negative energy to everything in the universe, right? And so with all those miracles comes the sort of the dark side, the the plastic and the polystyrene, the pollution, um, the degradation of uh, soil nutrition, sorry. Uh, no, I was just, I'm sorry to interrupt so quickly, but it's like, one thing that comes to me is that, is a lot of human waste due to our impetuance or our impetuance is in our, our, our need for speed. Because like for you to operate uh, at the speed of nature, nature works at a very different pace. Like I know for myself, when I go up to the farm after a busy day here in the studio or doing whatever we're doing, uh, there's, a breath. there's a different rhythm. Yeah. There's a totally different rhythm. And nature has this ease about it. And it's just, it goes at its own beauty. There's time to breathe, to work. Whereas when I think of industrialization or like, you know, a modern day industrial food system, it's got time, it's got KPIs, it's got, it's got results. It's, it's highly efficient. It's part it's of capitalism. It's a yeah. totally different speed. And I wonder, is that fundamentally the problem is that yeah. humans were trying to yeah. go too fast and do too much now? Yeah. Yeah. I think that, um, this is a big, Big one. Yeah. And there's no singular thing that we can pin it on. There's no one person saying, follow me down this, you know, pathway. It's, uh, it's, um, it's like looking at, um, uh, a colony of microbes in a Petri dish behave in a particular way. It's seeing these patterns of nature and um, I'm trying not to, in my head, compare us to sort of a, uh, cancerous nature yeah however as as, as negative as that sounds um the breeding uh of the human species the way in which we're developing the one thing i can see very clearly is that we're evolving at such a rapid rate and changing the face of the world um at a speed which we can't keep up the wisdom cannot keep up with the change so to give you an example like we're making these cataclysmic um decisions um take fracking uh, we're like right we've got this uh, we need energy so we can explode the earth's core to extract energy and we can use a very small amount of energy to get a lot of energy win so that's a kind of like short term decision, you know, under the kind of capitalist structure um, that's, you know, um, feeding uh, human greed, you know, money and da da da. And the long term implications of that decision are so negative that it's, of course, it's a terrible idea. Of course, it's it's toxic. You know, it's a Molotov cocktail of like 30 different uh, chemicals in exploding the Earth's core. Of course, that's insane. But yet it's happening. And there are thousands of examples of the same insanity. But yet we don't have 
the wisdom. There's not enough collective wisdom within the human species to be like, hold on a minute. <laughs> Let's just <laughs> take it easy. Make sense. Let's take it easy. Let's just take it easy for a sec here. The species dying every minute. There's, why don't we just slow down as a, as a uh, collective share society? Share our resources so everyone can be happy. You know, it sounds yeah. so simple when one looks at it like that. Another great example, which is kind of currently occurring, is uh, hydroponics. Now, hydroponics is growing produce in water with mimicking some kind of like nutritional benefits within the water, some. Now, that is... Uh, uh, so absurd to me. And that's because I have some degree of knowledge about nature, some, not a lot, some. And to a lot of people, to um, tech seems like the savior of the planet, right? Tech, you know, so impressive how amazing technology is and what it can do. And we kind of unconsciously obey tech and we kind of worship tech. And because it's like nature in tech, it's like an automatic win, but then you've kind of like got to like click your fingers, throw a bit of cold water in your face and be like, hold on, is this a good idea? Let's take a step back and think about the implications. Think about how many uh, micronutrients are in a teaspoon of healthy soil. Millions. How many of those micronutrients exist in that water? Two, three? I remember myself, or like I remember we went to do a commercial on a berry farm and I remember being so excited me and Dave went off and it was like I can't wait I'm gonna eat my weight in berries I just cannot wait and you know you go up and there's the beautiful poster and you go in and you're really really excited but it's much more in line of factory than it is farm like the 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 roots weren't in actual soil they were in what was known as core which is um pineapple coconut, coconut skin husk uh, there's all them like there's computer chips going in so they can measure the nutrients being pumped in. It's all like it was as far from my idea of a happy clappy farm and much more in line of factory. And I left feeling sad and disillusioned. Yeah. And yeah. kind of after that it was like, I don't want to buy industrial berries anymore. I don't think that's nature. No. For me, for me. I would like to, I don't have any kind of sway in the world of boycotting uh, that sort of tech but i wish uh, i wish i had more time to sort of protest against it because it's just so short-sighted and it was just such a shallow understanding of nature and this is this brings me to a, another significant thought and it's this observation that humans are anthropocentric anthropocentric is a uh, recently learned this word and it basically means nice word it's a great we got two good ones here today oh, i've Lumen got a few more the in the uh, pipeline Lumen. what was it go back to the first word again Lumen. our first new word liminal liminal, liminal. liminal. i'm gonna write that one down <laughs> <Liminal>. these <laughs> are new words for the day and anthropocentric anthropocentric is that we think ourselves above nature oh we really do and not um, in it. So humans um, extract things from nature to to give humans prosperity, to yeah. bring ourselves prosperity. But that is from a human centric worldview, the point of view that like we are separate from give nature. ourselves things that we want. And um, in that process, namely industrialism, we kill nature. Industrialism is the antithesis of nature. Industrialism is uh, where industrialism breeds, nature dies. Um, that's almost always true. Uh, urbanism specifically, um, but these industrial systems like monocultures, what does a monoculture do? Kills biodiversity, it kills the nutrition in soil, it kills the insects, it kills the worms, it kills just death. For what? some you know few farmers to profit and they argue and there's this fallacy that the only way we can feed the world is through industrial agriculture bullshit bullshit that's a complete fallacy if you ever see an organic regenerative farm and how productive it can be you'll never go back you'll never ever think that we need to rely on industrialism and an industrialist these monocultures have this kind of short window of prosperity in terms of produ and then produ productivity soil. and then the soil dies and then we're food life so, starts so, declining so to land like just to try to land some of like these concepts, these, which massive, I, these like, massive concepts, they're which philosophical, I agree. they're deeply philosophical. They're deeply philosophical and also they underpin the very food system. How have you grappled with taking these ideals and applying on a daily basis to running a highly sophisticated, gastronomical, exquisite restaurant 
that is the world's first zero waste Cause restaurant. Because it, it is a, an incredible expression of philosophy and rebellion in a physical, commercial, capitalistic food system. Like you've you've gone, you've created this pirate ship in the food system. Like you've got your own, yeah. your Captain Doug McMaster upon the zero waste ship of Silo. Nice, Dave. Yeah, Thanks. beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I did, didn't do that. Captain Doug, I over to you. I did many new words, so there was no liminal or anthropocentric, but hey. No, it's beautiful. Um, well, we've established that there's a certain motivation of anger um, unconscious. There's a Beauty. sort of feeling of that's a, a driving force behind Silo, and that is, um, yeah, that is true. Um, and um, for, for my dad was an artist, um, and I value expression and creativity and um, originality, and um, I wanted to get out of sort of working for other chefs, angry kind of manipulative chefs. I wanted to to stand on my own, stand away from that crowd. Um, and um, Silo is my sort of expression of a bunch of things that I believe in, you know, we're talking about now. And I guess um, I want to demonstrate that all of these values can exist as opposed to the problem, this homogenized industry of, you know, people just mimicking each other in this kind of circus and killing the planet. I want to prove that it is possible uh, to do things right. I mean, you two are doing it as well. Like, it, 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 yeah, I think there's a fear when you're in that mainstream that um, anything outside of that system will fail, you know, leave the system and it will fail. Um, and it is, um, by all accounts, very challenging to diverge from the status quo. There's a term in business, which is red ocean, blue ocean. A red ocean is this idea that uh, as a business, you're doing something similar to all of the other sort of sharks in the, uh, in that area of the sea, you know, all eating each other for, 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 you know, for custom. Um, and a blue ocean business is where you swim away, you diverge from the, the, the pack, um, the mainstream, the sort of, you know, example would be like pizza restaurants and beer and, you know, the, the, the common, um, uh, food places you would find in a city center or whatever. Um, silos swam away from that and doing things on its own accord. And that's a scary place to be. It's got some benefits, you know, um, we've done really well for, um, um, I guess, public attention. Talkability, we've, press. Yeah, there's like, you know, you, you attract people diversity. because you're different. And it's, well, you know, ooh, people who know. are very ethically mindset are like, yeah, mm. yeah. So there are benefits, but there are also, there's also an enormous amount of isolation and when you alienate yourself from what people understand, it makes it harder to fill those seats in your restaurant. It makes it harder to, to survive and stay buoyant as a business. Um, so the last 10 years, and it's coming up to 10 years now in the UK as, as Silo. Thank you. Yeah. Um, um, we're still afloat. In fact, we're, we're thriving. We're thriving now. In the last sort of two and a half years, there's been a number of um, socio-political occ occurrences in the planet. There's the internet. The advent of the internet has been um, so significant for all kinds of issues around the world. This transfer of information, this people are waking up to what has been occurring in these big corporate capitalist structures and are kind of like disgusted and angry and upset and sort of in their own ways, you know, finding alternatives and rebelling, whether it's the rise of veganism, the rise of plant-based cooking, um, or, you know, the, the disparity around sustainable food systems, waste, um, and silo is, um, was sort of, um, well, it's 10 years old and, um, a little bit ahead of the curve, which sounds like a good thing but it is a scary thing you know again you're oh, you're on your own leaving the charge exactly yeah. yeah and you've got to create everything from scratch you're not really building on yeah and um i guess uh it's just become this kind of um creative temple <laughs> and it what, we, what, what are some of the biggest learnings that you've had like in terms of how to manage it because like you've been doing this for 10 years and for and you've even, managed to stay afloat for even me and Dave and Arnie our head chef is in the room here today and like 
even on a daily basis, like, you know, we'll separate our waste, we compost a, f- a small portion of it and bring it up to our farm and we'll compost it and turn it into soil, nutrients for the soil. And like, how does one go from a concept of no bin in the kitchen to actually doing it? And even, you know, we're talking on a commercial ways, how does even someone listen and go, because the challenge is home I see every week like I do the bins in my house and there's a compost bin there's a plastic and paper and then there's the, the bin bin and it's every, challenging every and week, household that's every got, week I bring them to that bins and the happy pair and I feel ashamed and guilty I think of you I think of you waste is a lack of imagination I'm like oh shut up you know, I'm trying to quieten that voice, but you're there in my head every week. <laughs> I'm like, I'm really imaginative. Why am I doing this? <laughs> well, this is a nice opportunity to kind of go from a more philosophical kind of commentary to a more literal commentary. Yeah. yeah. Um, so systems design uh, would be the kind of uh, big statement in terms of yes, how to... give it to us, Doug. Give it to us, I like it. And what I can I can articulate around literal system change... Um, from silo to a typical or an, uh, a similar size restaurant or whatever. Um, so Yoast, all credit to Yoast for having that sort of amazing vision as as sort of simple as it is. It's genius. Um, get things from nature, <laughs> maximize all those resources within the restaurant and then compost it. You know, very simplistic. Now, 95% of what would necessitate a bin falls under that umbrella. So 95% of what's coming into silo is food from farms. Um, vegetables. Vegetables. And inputs, uh, food inputs. Yeah. And so literally that's, you know, how we do it. And we get... So you're all, dealing direct with the farmer, not with dealing the with the producer. middle person, not dealing with the distributor. It's just direct relationships. But then when you really start to sift through everything a restaurant like needs. How do you find a well, local you, grower of turmeric or a local grower of exactly, cumin seed? Or exactly. How do you find the more like you, even a black pepper? The more you go deeper into uh, the logistics of everything a restaurant needs, the more you're like, oh, that doesn't make sense. I can't get that from a farm. I can't get a light bulb from a farm. You need a light bulb to, you know, light a restaurant, right? You need um, all kinds of things. Like what but it depends on where you grow the rules because... You know, like you've gone to the tea where you're now ma- like uh, to the nth degree, I mean, where you're you've made tables out of mushrooms. You make, you know, you make plates out of the glass wine bottles like you are pushing this a lot further than most people. Like you, your rules of the game are more severe than other yeah. people might have imagined. Them. Or more sophisticated. Yeah. So two of the big sort of um, conundrums, um, kind of big kind of um, the one material that remains the one single use material that remains in our system is single use glass. And that is because we don't grow. Um, there's, there's not enough production of natural wine in the UK and wine is a natural wine is a very significant part of our offering. Very significant. And it doesn't have to be, but I want it to be. And so it is inevitable that we have single use wine because it's not local. And furthermore, a wine list is, is made up of... This a, is the glass rather than the wine. Yeah, but just thinking purely around the logistics, um, a wine list typically has 30 plus bottles of wine on it on a restaurant like Silo. Now, they're all coming with the values that we have, i.e. natural wine, you know, unfiltered. Um, um, by organic. By, by yeah, organic. like wine that's come from these small biodiverse, regenerative viticultures um, from various places in Europe, we cannot send those single-use, empty, dirty bottles back up those supply chains. There is, we are at least 10 years, maybe 20 years from that. I don't think that will ever happen. It doesn't really make sense. So that is what makes those empty wine bottles inevitable in our restaurant. Because if we didn't have the values of natural wine, we would get some, you know, industrially produced wine that has loads of sulfites in it from a local uh, winery. But we're not going to do that. We can, we're not going to do that. We can get wine on tap from, you know, these big blah, blah, blah. But we're not going to do that because we believe more so in soil health and biodiversity, etc. And so we, we buy this natural wine. We have this inevitability of single-use glass. So then what? What do we do with that? Where's the bin for that? 
And so that's one big predicament. Another one. And because most people like have this idea that I put my wine in the recycling box, my wine bottle gets recycled. But in reality, very little of it actually most gets recycled. Most ends yeah. up as cement, as aggregate for building materials. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe not worth going too deep into the glass recycling industry, but it's not great. Some yeah. places it's good. But it's intensive uh, in terms of energy resources. The amount of energy it takes to, to melt a wine bottle back into a wine bottle is massive. Plus, um, I think it's only something like one third of uh, this virgin glass gets recycled. The rest mm. goes to landfill. And in landfill, it takes 10,000 years to break down and excretes enormous amount of emissions in the process. So it's not good. Um, so we wanted to innovate there. But another one is like, uh, you know, but, the, but even just to clarify, so mm. because we may not come back to this, okay, to innovate yeah. there, you've got a potter on your site above Mark. the restaurant, Mark the potter, who literally breaks the glass in a machine that crushes the glass. He puts it in, he turns it into plates. He's a potter that turns them into plates, turns them into glasses, and he's actually on site turning waste glass into usable, tangible inputs for your restaurant. Exactly. But I'd just like to take a tiny step before that innovation or that actual reality manifesting into silo is that moment of like what was different in silo having that idea now it's a circumstance it's a limitation we've taken the bin away and said we don't have a bin and then we're forced to innovate we've 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 literally um put ourselves in a position where, <laughs> you know, the press are, uh, the press are on us. You know, there's a lot of attention on silo and we've not got a bin. We've taken that away. So we've got this unique creative opportunity to innovate. You know, we put that pressure on ourselves in a really fascinating way. And so when you're staring at this massive stack of single use glass bottles and thinking, oh, I'm not sure if this is the right thing here. How do we sneak these out of here without anyone seeing <laughs> Exactly. We can't. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we got to think about it, you know. But it forces creativity. It forces you to Boundaries. think in a way that marries your other set of values, which is a circular way of thinking. So with a circular way of thinking, how do you turn glass into the system in a way which is productive, efficient, and increasing the value of that process? You need to increase value, and I don't mean monetary value. That intervention needs to bear fruit. And so in my mind, by this point, this was um, this innovation was about four years into Silo in the UK, and I was sat on Brighton Beach and the beach has no sand. And I was thinking about this predicament of having single use glass and thinking, what is glass made out of? You know, going back to this sort of fundamental, oh, it's made out of silica sand or sand uh, in my mind at the time. And I was like, oh, what if we turned it back into sand ourselves? You know, just this free flowing kind of creativity. What if we turn it back into sand? Maybe we could rebuild beaches. Maybe we could, I don't know, turn it into something that we need. And that was the beginning of this thought process, followed by three days of searching the darkest place, you know, these kind of going deep into the internet, finding going into glass crushing. <laughs> Turns out there's this one machine in New Zealand of all places that had built a glass crusher that crushed glass like a flour mill would mill flour. And uh, that was my description, not theirs. And when you have a uniformed particle consistency that this machine machine created, it's like baking. If you milled flour and had these big lumps of wheat and small bits of flour, you're not going to bake a nice loaf of bread, are you? But if you have a perfect, even consistency of flour particles, you've got this consistent, workable product. And I was like, oh, this is great. This is, you know, the juices are going, the, the cogs, are, cogs are in motion. So if we can mill glass like we mill flour... Again, that dyslexic brain connecting the dots between different subjects. Um, then we've got a raw material. And so we refer to it as raw glass, the project. So we crush glass into this powder and sand, different gradients. Um, and then I went to the local potter, Mark, and said, can you melt this in your kiln to turn it into things that we need? Plates, tiles, crockery, tableware, light fittings, um, a sink. And since we've spent the last six or seven years now making some of the most profoundly beautiful objects I've seen in my life. 
Mark is a wizard. He's a he's a he's an artist. He's a a, a, a stunning craftsman that turns yeah our, our waste wine bottles into exquisite. It's kind of material that's in between marble and concrete. Um, but there's so much um, creative flair in this material, and you have to see it. Yeah, yeah. I remember well, you have seen it. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> the spoons. I remember the spoons. It was like it was nearly like bone porcelain. Yeah, yeah. Porcelain. porcelain. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. It was like yeah. wow, this is. But that demonstrates that thinking in circles. Um, and I think that, that's I think like that's one what's of, important. Like the most um, creative parts of nature, nature are the boundaries, the edges. And by you removing the bin, you have self-imposed a really difficult Hard. boundary which forces you to create in a different manner to what most people are and most people are that we all see creativity we want to be creative people but one of the keys to creativity ironically is restriction constraint yeah. opposition circumstance yes so you create an environment with a series of circumstances like I don't know, we're, we're milling flour, right? And we're like, oh, we're sifting out the bran because the bran's heavy and fibrous and we don't want to, we want a nice fluffy like sourdough. So you've got all this bran and six months later, you've got loads of bran. That is a circumstance of this zero waste system. And then you're like, right, this is where we innovate. So we have a list. Um, it's all online. It's all like a, you know, slick kind of program that we have, uh, we collate data on what isn't getting used, what isn't getting maximized. We grade things or rate things of like how well something is being upcycled. So I just take a, a second to talk about the word upcycling. Recycling is where a material goes back into that same material, like a glass bottle into a glass bottle, a can into a can. Now, thinking about the value metrics, you're, the value of a can versus a can is neutral. It's, it's it's zero. With the side note that there's energy used, extracted from nature, so it's kind of a negative. Well, yeah. it's definitely a it's negative. It's a loss. hundred percent, yeah. Now, upcycling is where uh, a material lives and dies in the same way, but instead it's turned into something with greater value, hence the up bit of it. So uh, a can can become something new. It's like a rebirth. It's not um, going to become a can. It's going to become something greater. It's going to become a prince or a princess. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the metamorphosis. This is where a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. And this is the raw glass. This is turning a, 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 a glass bottle that has negative value. You pay someone to take away that glass. And you're converting it into a plate that you could easily sell for 30 pounds or 40 euros, whatever. Um, and so that's upcycling. And then you start thinking in this in this way of like, right, upcycling, you're you're um with the minimal amount of uh, energy spent or exerted on a process, you know, you you don't want to spend 10 hours making a carrot top oil that doesn't taste very good. <laughs> you know, you want to spend a minute. Um, uh, I don't know, roasting potato skins into uh, delicious, uh, roasting potato skins and turning it into miso because it's absolutely bloody delicious. And it took you very little amount of energy to, to transform that potato skin into this butterfly of flavor, this incredible umami, salty, sweet miso. And I Potato said, a minute, skin, but miso, it takes wow. six months to make that miso. Yeah, it's, <laughs> but, um, it's time concentrated. It is. But if you think about the energy exerted in making that miso, it's dead easy. You just roast them in the oven, 160, forget about them until they're sweet and crispy. Add a bit of koji and salt. It's a very minimal intervention process. And then you just stick it in a sterilized jar in a cupboard and forget about it for six months and it tastes like sweet and don't even have to add moisture there's no moisture required in the miso there's very little moisture very very little but uh, that was more a demonstration that within this world of upcycling the the challenge the game you gamify this this is so much of silo success is we gamify this idea of upcycling and closing the loop in sophisticated ways. You know, it's a game to us. It's fun. It's so what would so you do with bran? So say you're so say you're milling the flour and you're getting bran and it's accumulating over six months and you got a lot of bran. You're like, what do we do with it? You press gotta, it all together and turn it into tabletops or something. Or make you know? You've like, got to listen to the bran. You've got to ask the brand. And I know that sounds weird, but there probably is a touch of listening going, where is this? Where do you want to go? Where do you, what, what do you, what are you? It's like going back to education. Like if you, um, if somebody's not good at maths, you know, don't throw numbers at them. 
you know, if somebody's creative and visual, put them, put them at a table with a pen and paper, you know, and that's the same thing with a brand. You listen to what it wants to become. It doesn't want to become something light and fluffy. It's heavy by nature. So you think, right, that's what, a protective layer. what do I need within the system that is heavy of nature? Ah, oh, well, we've got this new ice cream, this buttermilk dulce de leche ice cream. Maybe we could make a bran wafer to make an ice cream sandwich. Boom. You've asked it what it wants to become and boom, it finds its destiny. It finds its purpose within the system. And then that is that sophisticated closed loop. It's not just closing the loop for the sake of it. It's finding gold within um, Working with that, what things in, are in their essence geez, it's, Like it's like it's, teaching Trying to teach a, a fish to climb a tree It's well, just it, not built it's, for it's, it's, so, a yes. fun, yeah. it's a fundamental yeah. different way of looking at things Like I'm even looking at it kind of thinking Right, us, we've been in the food business for 20 years And I'm going To, to apply this to our system Is like we're going to have to relook Stop our system And relook at every aspect of the inputs or, or make micro changes But to fundamentally change it Would need to stop it and to relook it again well, and to well, it start starts it. with a mindset shift. Yeah, well, it really mindset. does. It's like it's like what you've done with Silo is it's a philosophical, philosophically different approach. Like it's a fundamentally different approach. And my question now is to you: like you've been at this ten years, you really have been at the helm, the innovator, the tip of the spear. Are there other people innovating and like continuing on on what you've started? Like, are there? Do you see more examples of zero zero waste restaurants across the world? People who are a network forming. It. Is slower are you than I less would, alone. <laughs> I do feel, yeah, a lot less alone. Um, and um, I think the word zero waste is still very abstract. It's still like you know, even at Silo, uh, I, I, maybe we'll come back to the very specificity, the very metric of zero, because zero is obviously a, 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 a word that represents an idea. It's not a specific ob, um, um, analysis of actual waste because no one has zero, zero, zero waste, not even silo. Well, humans don't fundamentally. So a system with humans in it is going to have waste. And it is, uh, a lot of people would say it's not possible. It is possible, not in this industrial world, but it is possible. Um, but we need to design all the materials in this cradle to cradle circular design, which doesn't yet exist. Like we still have pallet knives and silicon molds and, you know, things that are not circular in silo. Um, but you know, we've got to, um, work, with work within the bandwidth of our own sort of, uh, I just have this visual of a, an elastic band and you push, too hard to push the system too far out too quickly and it'll snap and so within the realm of our own sustainability we can push as hard as we can you know that elastic band doesn't you don't want to break it um and so over the 10 years it's got more and more sophisticated and complex and and less and less and less and less waste um, we actually have, did I show you the, the Tesseract to the cube? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, which is amazing. So I've still never seen the Marvel film, but apparently there's this blue cube called the Tesseract. Um, and, uh, Tim, a guy who it's makes... It's the center of the world or it's the kind of, it's some yeah, linchpin something. stone, magical stone <laughs> yeah. that can destroy the universe. Um, but if we, before I explain what that is, if we just define what, um, a binless restaurant or let's talk about a bin for a minute, right? So a bin is a kind of a broad word, you know, like words like love is a broad word. It can be used in so many different contexts. So a bin is, uh, a compost bin, a general waste bin. Or you could say, geez, that lad's like a bin. He can put food away. Like no <laughs> yeah. one I've ever seen. Like. But a compost bin and a general waste bin are polarized. One is really good bin and one is a really, really, really bad bin. A compost bin is more of a, a holding place, a holding silo, if you will, for food waste to be reborn into compost. That's not bad. That's great. That's a great thing. A general waste bin is a graveyard of poorly designed materials. Linear, industrial, consumer, dead materials. That's what goes in a general waste bin. Now, 
again, polarized difference. Silo, when I say we don't have a bin, it means we don't have a general waste bin. I try and teach, I try and encourage everyone to call the compost silo <laughs> because it's, it's, it's not a bin. I associate just in my own semantical way. Um, don't know if that's a word. Semantical. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll give it to you. Uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> it, we're obviously we write dictionaries. So yeah, we're, <laughs> we're very, in. the, um, the, 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 the compost bin, uh, sorry, a bin is a negative. It's the, the coffin, the grave yeah. of, of badly designed materials. And, um, that's the bin we don't have with the exception of our mistakes. So we make mistakes. We physically don't have that general waste bin. However, um, by our very nature, we fail, we make mistakes and up the supply chain, there is plastic everywhere, right? There's so much plastic, even in these regenerative farms everywhere. There's plastic everywhere. Now, that inevitably finds its way in, you know, mistakes, new employees at this new supplier, blah, 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 and just finds its way in. And, and we, we have this like, ah, uh, kind of, ah. Uh. So we have this sort of, we call it the alien waste bin. It's not, uh, it's not from that world, the silo universe. It's, 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 it's a, yeah, um, a non-native material. Anyway, so we collect it. And then our friend Tim, who makes knives out of NOS canisters that he finds on the street. Um, I said to Tim, could you, uh, do something creative with this actual waste to represent the kind of the, 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 the failing of the system or the, not the failing, but you know, this is their actual waste. So he um, took it. It was about three sort of large carrier bags of different plastics and a few other random bits of material in there, bits of foil, and um, went away and put it under one of these big like hydraulic presses that he has in his, his workshop and um, brought it back. And it, it's this blue because there was a lot of blue plastics that a lot of our dry goods came with this blue plastic because it's food food grade you know blue you yeah, can see yeah. it if it's you know um and so yeah we've got this blue cube that is about five inches by five inches by five inches um and it looks apparently like this tesseract um and it is such a work of art and that is you know i say that um fermentation is the last line of defense before food is wasted but uh tim's tesseract is the the kind of the last, the very last, uh, end of the very, the sort of the terminus of all materials in silo, the very end of the line that still isn't wasted because it's then turned into art, something that symbolizes this kind of mad creative journey that we're all on and proud of. And instead of being, you know, what waste always is hidden, it's not. It's it's there as a it's bringing our trauma out, a, into the, yes. out into the out into the open and going, hey, this is this that, is the way. We're, we're not perfect. We're in a part of a flawed system, right? It's I a wanna, trophy. Before we land this, I want to let's circle back to fermentation because we started like talking about fermentation. We started talking of Amazaki. We started talking about Koji, and like we are into fermentation. We've been Dave, fermenting you're closing the loop. Acid fermentation. I'm closing the loop. Absolutely. We're going full cycle here. We're forming our own. You're you thinking know. in circles, aren't you? I Dave? absolutely <laughs> am. Of course, in this company, how thinking. could I not? How could I not? Um, but like we've been fermenting for, you know, years. We really have. We're in it. But like yours is like next level. Like you, you are like fermenting 10.0. And could we even go back to Amazaki, Koji, and just give a little rundown on Koji? Because sure. we've definitely right. been doing lots of lacto, you know, lacto fermentation. Lactic acid fermentation. Okay, let's uh, silo fermentation here. Uh, you've got uh, lacto fermentation, which is your kimchi and your sauerkraut. 2% salt solutions. Yep. Those, yeah. yeah, anyone can do it at home. It's dead easy. Um, it's great zero waste applications, all that like wonky veg in your veg drawer that's got a bit flaccid and floppy. 2% salt, chuck it in a jar, boom, you've got lacto ferments. Great. Um, you've got drinks fermentation, so uh, tapaches and kombuchas. Kombucha, yeah. um, again, really o amazing opportunities to... Um, make banana skin to pache that would have been wasted. So some really nice um, applications of zero waste fermentation, even in the drinks fermentation world. Um, now, then we've got koji based, sometimes advanced fermentation, you could call it because there's a lot of technicalities to it. 
but it's koji based fermentation that has the greatest potential within our food systems to close the loop on all of the food that would have been wasted or is wasted. And now let's start with what is koji? Koji is a cultivated fungus. So it's existed in, uh, in Asia for thousands of years before electricity. It was designed to be a preservative. Um, it brings out all this mad umami flavors. Uh, misos have koji in it. Garums, uh, so uh, animal-based liquid ferments is a garum, um, have koji in it. So fish sauce has koji in it. Um, the Romans made uh, fish sauce without koji, just salt and fish. But, um, but predominantly fish sauces are made with koji. Soy sauce, which is also called a shoyu, uh, it's got koji in it. Amazake, amazake is a rice congee, it's like a rice porridge, has koji in it. And amazake is what makes sake wine. It's the unfermented um, uh, substrate of sake. Um, so it's just a rice porridge with rice koji in it. Um, that then gets fermented into 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 rice wine or uh, um, yeah sake. So so yeah, just to talk again about what uh, koji is. So you're growing this white mold in an incubator, which is set at thirty to thirty five degrees. You need an incubator for it. E a controlled room, a room where you can control e the humidity and the temperature. In essence, you can do if it you at want room temperature, temperature if it's a warm room. But it would be massively inconsistent. Yeah. Massively okay. inconsistent. Okay, incubator, perfect. Yeah, Incubator. So you degrees. can make it out of an old box, uh, an insulated box, an old fridge. Uh, you put a, a temperature thermometer in there, 30 degrees. Um, a humidifier, you want about 70, um, around 70 to 80% humidity. Uh, so humidity is quite important. And ideally, not essential, but ideally, um, a circulator, so the air, the and moisture the and all the airflow is moving around. So you can make it for less than a hundred quid. Anyone can make it at home. I wouldn't jump at it if you don't have a deep knowledge of this whole process of koji. But um, if you're a food nerd and want to grow koji, you can do it for under a hundred quid at home. We use our uh, chefy combi ovens because um, they just naturally can do that. Um, and so, what does koji do? It's a fungus. We're growing mold. Uh, you buy these spores. It's just a little tiny white bag of powder that is imported from Japan, but it's the weight of like a gram. <laughs> and a gram, one gram of these white spores can turn 100 kilos of grain into koji. So it's an extraordinarily... Um, wow. It has an extraordinary... Prolific. Prolific yeah. output. Yeah. Fertile. <laughs> it's very fertile. Well, when you think of spores, you think of seeds and you go... Yeah, it's a bit like semen, you know, you you can repopulate it. <laughs> what it is, it's just yeah. like it's the nature's way of expressing itself. It's biology's capacity Wanting. to constantly want to be regenerate, re regenerate and reproduce. Mm. Like it's whether it's yeah. whatever Expanding example growth. of seed and you're looking yeah. for. So when you've got this koji, you can actually just buy koji online. You can. It's dried and it's less potent, less virile. Um, but uh, you can just buy it online. It's very easy to buy. And it's always a white powder, is it? Mm, no. It's sometimes like a kind of dried white ricey grain thing. Um, the mold's just dried over the rice. But you've uh, so we make it fresh because it's more vir virile. And then so this is this is the good bit. Any surplus that you have in your kitchen, you can put in with a hand blender or a big spoon in a big tub about. 14% koji, that's our kind of sweet spot. 14% koji. And the rest blended veg. Um, so it works well with veg, but um, I'll give you a bunch of examples. But um, salt is the other key ingredient here because salt Stops. prevents bad bacteria yeah. forming. So we're talking um, fish sauces can have up to 20% salt, so really Ooh. salty. Um, there's a lot of um, potential harmful pathogens and stuff, uh, you know, in, 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 in fish that you want to really protect against. So that's why it's slightly higher salt. Um, things like we make um, when we churn butter, we have all this buttermilk. We'll reduce it down to caramelize it. So it's really intense. And then that's as low as 8% salt. So it's not really dangerous. It's not very not a lot to worry about in terms of bacteria and microbes. So, yeah, it's as low as 8% salt. Once we did 6% and then you've pretty much got always 14%. You can go lower or higher. 
occasionally we go to 20% koji. And just imagine that salt, koji, waste, blend it all together, stick it in a sterilized vessel. You get these crocs, uh, but you can use any just like solid container. And then you just basically keep that environment sterile. Sometimes for the longer kojis, mold will grow on the top and you just just scoop it off. Um, there's ways of preventing that and the environment you're storing it in. But let's just for simplicity, just say you just stick it in um, a cupboard. A, obviously not. This is not something that you make in the fridge. Um, it'll go too slowly. Um, and you seal it. And you you uh, you want aeration in a yeah. lot of these things. Um, so cover it, but leave the lid. Yeah, exactly. A, a cloth over the top, um, a perforation. Um, yeah, something that can uh, circulate oxygen. Um, stirring it in the first few months is really helpful to speed things up and keep things safe. Um, but that's it. It's really simple. And, and who? Who? This is the thing. When and when I think of this, and gone. Who is the brave owl soul that kind of goes right? Let's start a fermentarium and let's start messing around with Koji. And then like six months later, you've got this batch with mold on the top. And you're going, right. Ah, sure. Listen, Monday morning. Why don't we have a lash of this for breakfast and see what happens? Like, um, We describe the, the gastronomical experiences like defined by fire and ferments. We cook all the food on fire and there's just, there is fermentation in almost every dish. Um, for a lot of reasons, we use it as seasonings. We use it, uh, we use when we do a lacto ferment, we'll have some of the brine to not waste it in some of the dressings and to elegantly close all these loops to not waste as to waste as little as possible or to compost as little as possible. Rather, um, we want to maximize all these re resources in these circular designs. And so because fermentation is at the end of the production, um, all those difficult uh, ingredients that we can't find enough of an outlet for, it's capturing all of what would have been waste. So there is just naturally a lot of things fermented and they're all bloody delicious. They're all absolutely exquisite because we've got good at it over the years. And, and you know, even that maize that we tried in your house was just like tapping at it. It was sweet. It was olive -y, It was earthy. It was like umami. It was chocolate. You were just like, what the hell is that? Yeah. And yeah. It, was, it, it has that slight bizarreness that you're like, I shouldn't like it, but I really want more of it. Yeah. I'm yeah, so, yeah. it's like explodes this curiosity in you. And that was called fridge cleanse miso. And I had a bunch of random stuff in my fridge that was just never going to get used in these kind of odd bits. And I just hand blended them all together with koji and salt. And it was on my shelf since three or four years ago. And that's what you taste. Oh, yeah. And you just use it almost like marmite or whatever, popping a slice that of That particular or... one had loads of darkly roasted, um, yeah, darker flavors. Uh, the outer leaves of red cabbages that were roasted and then blended, you know, like darker flavors. Um, but, um, but we've got about one and a half tons of this koji based fermentation at silo. And it's, it's born from just what would have gone into compost basically. Um, so, um, and it's pretty much concentrated flavor. It's a bit like, you know, I use tamari. It's an ingredient. I use It's just a lazy man's yeah. flavor. Like you could almost bottle this up and sell it as instant flavor for people to add to dishes because you've got like time, you've got fermentation and you've got serious flavor development, salt and, you know. But there's something very poetic about this fermentation asset to the zero waste kind of universe. And it's that when you give birth to the flavors of koji based fermentation, you're tasting these, you know, you've just described it like deeply complex flavors. You don't design a dish from a carrot when it's going to be paired with that, where, with a ah, deeply complex umami flavor you design from the point of that flavor. So the way chefs design food is they sit on, on a bench at the end of the day and just think, oh, that sounds nice. And I'll weave these things together. Um, now, we design food backwards. We <laughs> ferment all of this incredible uh, umami rich um, flavor from what would have been waste from the circumstance of our own system, of our own creation. So we're, we're, we're not wanting to, we don't have a bin. 
So we're not throwing things away. So we're fermenting it as a, like a last resort. And then we're discovering gold. Like some of the flavors are just the best flavors on earth. It's the irony. It's a bit like the wounded healer, you know, you know, Chiron's the wounded healer in astrology. And it's the irony is that because of his wound, he therefore has to deal with this stuff and becomes one of the greatest healer that exists. So exactly. it's a bit like paralysis is unbeknownst leading you to this gift. Creativity. And so when we design a dish, it's always from a fermentation that is sometimes years old <laughs> that imagine years prior when that thing was you know being turned in you don't have any idea what this will taste like in two years you have no idea there's a sort of a beautiful kind of um roll of the dice this kind of your the future is in the hands of microbes and bacteria. microbes and time you know and it's the flavor of time and two years later you're then designing a dish based on what you did two years ago it's it's quite magical and poetic and circular and closed loop again yeah. yeah it's but that's where we design dishes from that point start with a strong flavor start with a strong flavor and balance well, try to find harmony the kind of the rule of cooking you don't design uh dishes or you know flavors from the most uh, plain you design from the most complex flavors. I mean, maybe I, I haven't actually said that out loud or thought about that before, but naturally I, I assume that, you know, when you're creating a dish, you think immediately, maybe unconsciously of the most dominant flavors, and then you let that guide the dish because it's dominant. Um, and that's certainly the way um, with, yeah, with, with Silo. Amazing, right? Can we got to land this shit. To land this, for anyone listening who's gone, Doug, you've lit a spark in me. I'm feeling, I want to join your Rebel Alliance. I want to, I'm all aboard the pirate ship. Number Where one. Where does one start? Okay. His first book of all, is amazing. His book is brilliant. Like I read, I listen to lots of books, but I don't read, I, I collect books and I buy a lot of books, but I did read your book. I really did. And I've carried it around in my bag for months. And I like, when I went on holidays. What's it called, Dave? It's called Silo, the Zero Waste Blueprint, a food system for a future. It's really, really cool. It really, really is. And it's very, very visually, it's artistic, it's philosophical, and it's funny as well. There's lots of funny little bits in it. So where do people start? So they start with the book and then Instagram, how, how does, uh, Instagram kept Doug McMaster, check Silo out. What are simple things people can do on a daily practical? Doug, I mean, what are little things that I can do to feel like, yeah, I'm part of Doug's club, but I, I, you know, I'm not there yet, yeah, Doug, yeah. but I'm, I'm flirting. I'm flirting with you, Doug. The, the, the most important uh, thing um, is intention. Well, there's a process where you become aware of something, then you educate yourself on the thing, but Prior to the awareness and the education is an intention. You have an intention to um, to to improve um, behavior. Uh, you know that's just one example. But we set an intention and we we pursue that intention with a, an amount of awareness and then an, an education that's um, value based. Now uh, to to be more literal. Um, there are, there are tons of things you can start with and it all is relative to your geography, your environment. Are you in an urban area or are you not? Um, the thing that I find the most fulfilling, well, you can also take away the bin <laughs> if you want. You can go go hard. You can take away the bin or you can create Adversity. the environment to nurture. Just be prepared to deal with you know, failures, multiple yeah, failures. It yeah. just speeds up the failure process if you do remove the bin. Exactly. And frustrations will come quicker. <laughs> Yeah, you know yeah. that's the reality. That's yeah, the right. yeah. We we jump off the edge loads of times, and yeah, you, but if you can withstand banging your head a lot, like you've obviously, you've a very hard head. Like I have a very hard head, um, <laughs> metaphor but, metaphorically, um, metaphorically, yeah. and, and and just to say, like you're one of the greatest philosophers that I know. Like you really, oh, I admire. I like this conversation. Great job. Thank you. So here, here. But I think that um, uh, our, our mutual friend, I keep calling him a friend. I've never met him, but Zach Bush, who oh, you've Zach's had on the show, yeah. his um, Yoast's friend <laughs> and your friend. And I just, I text him a few times, but um, um, he's enlightened, I think, all of us to the reality of um, the future relative to what industrial agriculture is doing to the health of humans and the health of the planet. And that feeds into the thing that I see separately as the most important thing is supporting people that support your own values 
And what that means is like, if we have these values, if we're listening to this podcast and we believe in what this conversation is um, suggesting, then you know, we, we, we want to go, we want to, we want to buy into the same community of values. We want to buy into farmers markets and bulk shops and people that believe in biodiversity and nature. And, and so food. use your wallet as a weapon, you know, use your we wallet a weapon, not against <laughs> the farmers that you're buying food from, but against the big corporate capitalist death machine that is Go on. I was just going to say on that note, the thought came to me. There's a lot of people listening that kind of go, oh, I'd love to go eat in your restaurant. It's in London, but I don't live in London and yeah. I live somewhere else and blah, blah, blah. Like, did you ever consider creating a Patreon account that people could just give you a tenner and go, I love what you do. Here's a tenner towards your revolution. Hopefully it'll get you a little bit further. A like, few more pirate flags. <laughs> creating a Patreon account is a way that people can go, I want to support you, not just the local farmer with 20 euro or whatever. And, you know, yeah, can continue no, the food system. I, I, like it seems like a I'm simple thing. I've not thought to... to do that. I feel self conscious about charging. I don't but know. But it's not charging. You do, it's do just, lots of yeah. talks. You do lots of talks, which is a great I, thing I to do, do. So people can. You know, I, I, I just any chance I can to like, you know, to talk about these things, I just will anyway. But you also um, do them to corporates to get paid for as a source of income. I think which that, is great um, diversifying the sort of the silo world and I'm not shy to talk to, it's not like I'm on some sort of silos on this high horse that we're like, we don't have a bin. We will not be associated with big corporates. I, on the contrary, would take any opportunity to go into some big corporate capitalist structure and talk compassionately to everyone in that building about waste, the way of thinking, because if one person has, you know, a bit of interest in one of the things that I'm saying, and that leads into two actions in that person's life, maybe to their kids, that then, you know, it has this snowball effect into the future, which I'll take it. I'll take that. I'll take that chance. And in the 10 years of um, thinking and talking like this, I'm not saying it's because of silo, but there's been an enormous amount of change in the world of zero waste. Enormous, enormous. It's incredible. And I just believe that the most powerful thing that, you know, we three can do is um, change um, the food system in this creative, compassionate, you know, I never see you two bashing anyone over the head that eats meat. Never once, you know, have you had any sort of negative reaction to something that isn't your own values. And I think that that's something that I've looked, I've witnessed with you two and, 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 and try and carry on in my own work, you know, and, and thus go into, you know, environments where, you know, kill them with kindness and just like blow their heads off with information that, that makes it a win-win or makes it like, Oh my God, this is absolutely the future, shift. you know? So that's just how I sort of see it and how I invest my time into people and communities in the future. You're amazing. You really are. You're such a fun to create. How, how can people get in touch with you? Is it via Instagram Instagram's or is it a great one? I yeah, think. Instagram. Yeah, okay. yeah. McMaster Chef is mine. And then there's um, um, Silo London and then the Zero Waste Cooking School, which is uh, kind of looking more at the domestic space for looking at similar ideas. <laughs> oh, uh, disclaimer, uh, that was a project that I started in lockdown and then realized I don't have time to run this channel. So I, it's a side project that I, I can't sometimes give enough Sometimes gets inspiration, attention. sometimes doesn't. Yeah. Uh, but it has the potential to do everything that Silo does in a more kind of accessible, domesticated version of Silo. That, that sounds like a very necessary project. I think so. Yeah. And I, I just need a bit of help. Well, maybe it could be this um, anyone you know, listening Patreon who's, account. This anyone's Patreon listening account. who's got a spare wad of cash who wants to invest in it, Doug's up for it. Or even just to, create, to get yeah, another human to resource work. to help. Yeah, if, run, if, run if you're somebody that understands the world of communication and believes in what we're, this conversation's about and wants to help me, <laughs> I will take it. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, let's yeah. end there. Doug, yeah. you're a legend. Oh, thank, thank you so thank much. Brilliant. Yeah, Dave. absolutely. Love you both. Adore thank you. Me. You're brilliant. Wow. Woo! Doug McMasters, you were lit. Oh, uh, is that all right? Yeah, that, was lit. Uh, that, was as, uh, that was as that was an enjoyable as enjoyable a conversation as I've had. Oh, yeah, really? Good. Yeah, like really, really mind-blowing.